Okay, let's continue in our lecture. Let's briefly recap what we did last time. So last time we uh, proved Ullmann theorem. Okay, we introduced some properties of the quantum fidelity, and uh, there we saw that the quantum fidelity and the trace distance they do have kind of an inverse behavior, right? And this uh, suggested then a relation between both of them. And in particular, in the end, we stated the relations by the so-called Fuchs van de Graaff inequalities. And now, in today's lecture, we start uh, with proving this. Also, I, first, I uh, recap this uh, theorem, and then we prove it. And then we're going to continue and do some examples. Bec uh, to where we use now the trace distance and the quantum fidelity in order to see and to quantify how uh, a noisy channel, for example, uh, how this one affects our state. Okay? Because now we have our tools together and we can now use them in order to do what we initially intended to do, which was quantifying how a noisy operation uh, changes our state. Right, by comparing the state after this noisy operation with our initial state. This, uh, we're going to do it uh, after this, after, afterwards, and then at the second part of today's lecture, we start with, uh, a quantum, uh, uh, with quantum entropies, or first with entropy and information, in the sense that we're going to quantify what information is. Okay, so let's start with uh, Fuchs von der Graaff inequalities. So last time we stated theorem 3.11. Let me briefly, briefly recall this. These are the Fuchs van der Graaff inequalities. And I state that the fidelity And the trace distance between the quantum states rho and sigma they satisfy. that 1 minus the fidelity of rho and sigma is smaller or equal to the trace distance of rho and sigma smaller or equal to square root of 1 minus the squared fidelity of rho and sigma. So this is equation 3.108. And we're going to prove this theorem now. So first, let's consider the second inequality, okay? So, consider the second inequality first. What we do is, suppose that the pure state Psi and Phi are a purification of rho and sigma such that the fidelity f of rho sigma is equal to the inner product of phi and psi. So by Ullmann theorem, we know that we can find such, a pur such purifications, right? Because Ullmann theorem there we have a maximization over all purifications with an equality, right? Meaning that there exists su such purifications that, that this is true. And we, now we suppose that phi and psi are these purifications. Okay? And next, um, the next thing we do is uh, we recall the monotonicity of uh, the trace distance. So next by the by the monotonicity 
of the trace distance and the trace preserving operations we have the following we have that the trace distance between rho and sigma is greater or equal to the trace sorry smaller or equal smaller or equal to the trace distance between psi and phi since the partial trace operation is the trace preserving quantum operation. So in, in the theorem, it was uh, equation 379. So this was the theorem uh, where we had, let me briefly call this here, where we stated that under trace preserving quantum operations, we had that the trace distance of E of rho and E of sigma must be smaller or equal to the trace distance of rho and sigma. Right? So this was a theorem that we, that we stated. If E is a trace preserving quantum operation, what we now do is we take here the state psi and phi and as a trace preserving quantum operation, we use the partial trace. Okay, because the, taking the partial trace preserves the trace. And this gives us then this inequality here. Okay. Um, okay now we need one more ingredient. Um, and uh, I think you're going to prove this on the exercise sheets. It's, uh, not too complicated, but I'm not uh, doing this proof here. So further consider the equality that uh, the trace distance between two pure states, psi and psi, is equal to the square root of 1 minus the fidelity squared of psi and phi. So which you're going to prove in the exercises. Then we get the following. So then we start here with the trace distance of rho and sigma. We know that it's smaller or equal to the trace distance of psi and phi. And this we know, for pure states, we know this equality. Right? I mean, I didn't prove it, but you're going to do it in the exercises. So we know that this is square root of 1 minus f squared of psi and phi. And since we uh, suppose that psi and phi are the purifications for which we have uh, this, uh, this equality here, we know that this is 1 minus f squared of rho and sigma. And this proves now the first inequality here of uh, the Fuchs van der Graaff inequalities. This is equation 3109. Okay. Then we can now continue with the first inequality. So we just proved this one. Now we're going to consider this one here. So consider the first inequality. So let now be, so the pure Vm, let Em be the POVM for which 
um, the fidelity of rho and sigma is equal to sum over m squared of pm qm with the probabilities pm being the trace of pm rho and qm the trace of pm sigma. And uh, we know that there is such a pure vm such that we have this equality, right? So this we also proved in the theorem, where we showed that the quantum fidelity is a lower bound of these classical fidelities, given, given uh, by a minimization. And uh, there we also proved that we can always find a pure vm such that there is an equality. Right? And now we suppose that this pure vm is this pure vm for which we get this equality here. Right? And then now suppose, uh, consider the following, namely on the one hand, we have considered this quantity sum over m and then square root of pm minus square root of qm squared. So let's multiply this out, the square. So we have sum over m and then we have pm plus qm minus 2 square root of pm qm. Okay, sum over pm gives 1 because it's a probability distribution. The same here. And what's here is nothing else but the uh, expression here of the fidelity. So we get 1 plus 1 minus 2 times sum over m square root of pm qm, which gives 2 minus 2 times the fidelity of rho and sigma. But consider also the following. So let's write down this, the same expression again. Um, so on the one hand, we have this. And on the other hand, on the other hand, we use the following inequality, namely that um, qm minus pm or p minus qm squared is smaller or equal to the modulus of pm minus qm times pm plus qm. So we use now this inequality such that Using this, we get that the sum over m squared pm minus squared qm squared is now smaller or equal to sum over m. And then we have squared pm minus squared qm times squared pm plus squared qm. And this is smaller or equal. We can multiply this out. So we get um, the modulus of pm um, minus qm, right? And you know that this is two times the distance of to the classical distance between these probability distributions, right? Because it's nothing else than the definition with the factor of two, and uh, we know uh, that that the distance is bounded from above by the quantum trace distance. So this is smaller or equal to two times the trace distance between rho and sigma. So hence we found, so we find that if we put this together, right, this is the same expression in here. So we find that two times the trace distance uh, sorry, that this 2 minus 2 times the fidelity is smaller or equal to 2 times the trace distance. So we find 2 minus 2 times fidelity of rho and sigma 
it's more equal to the trace test, two times the trace distance of rho and sigma. And now, one minus fidelity of rho and sigma, small equal to d of rho sigma. So this finishes the proof. So, and you see that in order that you can prove these things, we must know the properties of the fidelity, right? Because we just used those important theorems that we stated before of the fidelity. So, meaning how does it, how does it uh, change if we have a trace-preserving quantum operation? Or what, what is it, its relation to uh, the classical fidelities? Right, that, the quant that we have that the quantum fidelity is the minimum of the classical fidelities with the minimization running over all PUVMs. So these are really important properties and they're useful and you just saw that we used them to prove this uh, Fuchs van der Graaff inequalities. Now I want to state the relation between fidelity and trace distance under certain conditions, namely, first, if we ha compare a pure state and a mixed state. So you possibly, be, you possibly remember that if you compare pure and mixed state, uh, the fidelity, the expression of the fidelity becomes easier. And now here for the Fuchs von der Graaff inequalities, this inequality can be made tighter. Um, so, state this. First, if we compare pure states or a pure state and the mixed state. First inequality in equation one hundred eight. So these are the Fuchs von der Graaff inequalities. Um, can be made tighter. Namely, 1 minus the squared fidelity of psi and rho is smaller to equal to trace distance of psi and rho. So note the difference is here the square of the fidelity. right? Here we have no square. But if we compare a pure state and a mixed state, we get a square. So there's a tiny difference. But this is a, a tighter expression here. And the second uh, remark is an important remark which I used in the proof, namely when comparing pure states. The trace distance and the fidelity They are related by an equality. Maybe infidelity, no, the trace distance of psi and phi is equal to the square root of one minus the fidelity squared of psi and phi. So proof of one and two is an exercise. <coughs> 
So I'm, it's not sure yet whether this is going to be an exercise sheet, but otherwise this is an exercise. Possibly we're going to do this. Okay, this we just used in the in the in the proof of the Fuchs von der Graaf inequalities. So and this is really an interesting statement, namely. The reason is that this, there is an equality. So this shows us that the trace distance and the quantum fidelity, they both serve equally well if you want to compare states, right? Um, okay, so with this, we are now finished with our discussion on those measures with which we can compare uh, quantum states. And now we briefly gonna see those measures in action because our initial goal was that we can uh, quantify how a quantum operation changes our state. So if there's a quantum operation which describes a noise, then we wanna find out how does this change our state. And we, with these tools now we can then, for example, calculate what's the fidelity of uh, our of uh, between our initial state and the state after this noisy quantum channel, right? So keep in mind the picture that there's Alice and Bob which want to communicate and Alice sends a message to Bob, for example, through a quantum channel. So she sends a quantum state to Bob through a noisy channel. And now we have the tools to compare the state that she sends with the state that Bob receives, right? So let us briefly do this. This is section 3.2.5, quantifying the effect of quantum operations. using the quantum fidelity and the trace distance. We can now quantify which extent the quantum map E affects our initial state. So E of rho equal to rho prime um, affects our initial state rho. by calculating f of rho, rho prime, or the trace distance of rho and rho prime. Okay, so there's actually no, not much more to say, uh, but just do an example, right? I mean, we have all the tools together. We know how to express quantum operations. We now, now we know how to deal with fidelity and trace instance. So we can uh, calculate this, right? We have all the tools. And to see this in action, now we simply do an example, right? And the first example is, uh, let's take a look at the depolarizing channel that we've seen, okay? So consider the depolarizing channel. Uh, which uh, with the following map. So we had E of rho is equal to one minus P rho plus P identity over two. 
um, for a qubit. So as a system, we consider a qubit initially in the state rho. And we suppose now that Alice sends this qubit to Bob. However, there's some noise in this operation. And this noise is described by, this, by the map of the depolarizing channel. And uh, we've seen the depolarizing channel before when we discussed uh, some examples for such noisy operations. And let us now quantify how this changes uh, or, or what, what is the fidelity of E of rho and rho. So um, the fidelity F of rho and E of rho becomes okay, so now it's simply Calculating this thing. So what I forgot to say that we consider the pure initial state. So suppose that rho is pure, because we want to make life easy for our example. So let's calculate this thing here. We have the fidelity of our initial state, which is pure, and uh, our fidelity of the state after this depolarizing channel. Okay. Fidelity between a pure state and a mixed state gets the simple form of the square root of this pure state. So, uh, where the, um, and then here our state E of psi. So this is sandwiched. And then we take the square root, right? And we can now plug in uh, the map of the depolarizing channel, so we get square root of psi, and then we have 1 minus p times our initial state, plus p times identity over 2. Okay. Now let's multiply this out here. So we have square root of, this gives us 1 minus p, and then plus one half, which is one minus p half. So you see that the higher p, the smaller this fidelity is, meaning the higher the probability that there is noise in our channel, the smaller is the fidelity between the initial state and the state after the channel, meaning the state reduces the similarity of, the, of uh, the initial state and the state after this channel. So it's quite intuitive result. Now let's uh, see how the trace distance looks like. So on the other hand, for the trace distance, We get the following trace distance of psi and 
e of psi, which is uh, one half, and then the trace of modulus of psi, so that's not large modulus, minus, and now let's plug this in, so minus one minus p psi minus p times identity over two, which is one half times the trace of, okay, now let's multiply this out. So we have one minus one, this cancels, then plus p, and here we have minus p, so p goes out of the trace, so we have p half, and then psi minus identity over two. So this is 3.115. Okay, now let's calculate this thing here. Well, what we know is that this state psi and the identity, they commute, right? So this, this thing here commutes with this thing here. It's clear because we have the identity, so it does commute. And we know that for two, so if these two things commute, then we know that the trace distance of them is given by the classical trace distance of their eigenvalues, right? So this thing here, for this thing, we can write down the classical trace distance of their eigenvalues. Okay. Since psi and the maximally mixed state identity over two commute. Their trace distance is equal to the, the classical trace distance of their eigenvalues which are for this pure state psi the eigenvalues are 1 and 0 because it's pure and for the maximally mixed state the eigenvalues are 1 half and 1 half okay. hence we get that the trace distance of psi and e of psi is equal to p half and then we have the sum or okay, let's not write this as sum but we have simply the modulus of one minus one half plus the modulus of zero minus one half right so this gives one half and this gives one half so it's one in total and this gives them p half Okay, so again, what we see, it's now intuitively, if we increase the probability for noise in the channel, then the initial state, the, the distance between the initial state and the state after this noise operation gets larger. Okay. So intuitively clear that uh, this uh, holds, right? And... Um, well, it's now the example that, uh, with where we simply use the trace distances and the uh, quantum fidelity to quantify now how strong uh, these noisy channels act up on our state. Now let me do another example. Namely, uh, consider the bit flip channel following operation elements namely e naught is 
square root of 1 minus p identity and d1 square root of p times the Pauli x operator. So we considered this also before in the lecture, this bit flip channel, where we discussed these examples of noisy channels uh, for qubits, right? So now let's also calculate the fidelity for this channel. Um, so similarly, for an initially pure qubit, we get the following fidelity. So we get the fidelity for our initial pure state. And now this bit flip operation acting on the uh, initial pure state. So the square root over psi. And now as this operation, we have uh, E naught, this is, which is 1 minus p times the identity on the state. So we get 1 minus t times the state psi since with probability 1 minus p nothing happens, right? Plus with probability p, we have this uh, Pauli x gate, so plus p times, um, times x psi. And then sandwiched. Okay, so this is the expression of uh, in this operator sum representation, right? So we have uh, the operation element E naught, which is square root of 1 minus p identity, which is here square root of 1 minus p identity from the left, and, this, and then E naught dagger from the right, which gives in total 1 minus p, and the identity does nothing in our state. Right, so this is E naught psi E not dagger, and this is E1 psi E1 dagger, so which is our, uh, our operator, operator, operator sum representation of this quantum operation. Okay, now we can multiply these terms out. So for the first term here, we get a 1 minus p, and for the second term here, we get a plus p times psi x psi and this model is square. Okay. And what you see now is that the fidelity depends on our initial state. Okay. So this is different to our first example. Now here in this example, it does depend on this state. So this is equation 3, 117. So now the fidelity depends on the initial state. For example, if our initial state, say, is 0, then 
we have the fidelity f0 e of 0 is equal to 1 minus p plus so what is what happens if this is 0 then x acting on 0 gives 1 and the overlap with 0 is 0 so we have 1 minus p let me write this down uh, 0 x 1 modulus square is equal to 1 minus p plus 0 1 modulus square equal to 1 minus p okay so in this case we see that uh, this bit flip channel introduces noise uh, such that the fidelity of uh, the state after this bit flip channel uh, reduces in this way. Right. So on the other hand, for example, suppose that our initial state is 1 over square root of 2, 0 plus 1. Okay. Then then we have that x times psi is equal to psi. Because if I flip 0 and 1, then the state remains unaffected. And hence, we have that uh, the fidelity of psi and e psi is equal to 1. OK, let me. I think we can see it. it's equal to 1, so because it's square root of 1 minus p plus p times psi, psi modulus square, which is equal to 1, right? This, this step we just, we, just, we just saw here, because if x acts on this initial state, then it uh, remains unaffected, meaning that here we have simply the inner product of the state with itself. Since it's normalized, it gives 1. And then we have 1 minus p plus p gives 1. So here we see that if we take this initial state, nothing happens. So this initial state does not, go, does not undergo noise in this bit flip channel. Okay? And this is, with these examples, you should see that now the fidelity depends on our initial state. But how can we then quantify how well, or how can we then quantify the noise if the noise only acts uh, on some initial state. And one uh, possibility to do this is to simply take the worst case, okay? taking the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario would then be a minimization over this expression here. So, so to quantify the noise, we can consider the worst case worst case scenario such that um, um, such that we can say okay the, the uh, fidelity, the mi we take uh, the minimum fidelity in this case uh, by a minimization over all uh, pure states psi of this expression f of psi and the channel e of psi. So in this case, this expression is independent on the state again and it quantifies now the worst case scenario that we have. Okay, so let's, let's also now consider what happens uh, in the case where we want to see whether a uh, quantum operation uh, which should ideally perform, say, a gate operation, a unitary gate operation, uh, 
uh, how, does, how can we now quantify noise in such unitary gate operations? So as an example, consider, uh, take a, uh, an operation from quantum computing that you want to perform, and there we describe this, for example, in the circuit model as a unitary gate operation. Okay? So ideally, the operation that you want to do is you want to perform a unitary on, say, an initial pure state. However, there might be some noise in your quantum computer or in your quantum device with which you want to perform this calculation. And what you then have to compare is the ideally unitary transformed state with the state uh, which is transformed according to this noisy operation that you actually perform. Right? So now we are comparing a perfectly unit transformed state with a state which undergoes under, uh, some noise. Um, so, so um, the trace distance or the distance measures so distance measures allow us or they also allow us quantify how well a certain quantum operation on the state row has been performed. So, uh, suppose uh, we want to, or we um, suppose we want to perform um, an operation. ideally described by the unitary U however due to imperfections operation is according to the map E. And this we describe by the so-called gate fidelity. So now we can quantify the success of the gate operation. 
by the gate fidelity. And similar as before, we now minimize over uh, all pure states. So we take, this denotes now the fidelity of this gate operation. So ideally it's u, u, the unitary u, but due to noise and imperfections we perform uh, an operation described by E. And then we define this uh, gate fidelity as a minimization over all pure states and we minimize the fidelity of, uh, of, the, e of the ideal transformation, which is u acting on psi with uh, the operation uh, which includes noise. So this is now very similar as, as we've seen it before here, right? The only difference is that uh, now we compare with the ideal unitary transformation. So as an example, uh, consider um, that ideally we want to perform a, a quantum knot gate. Um, so suppose that ideally we want to perform the unitary u being the quantum knot gate. But instead, the operation or the noisy operation is described by the following uh, quantum operation. So we have the probability 1 minus p. We have uh, the, the ideal operation. And then with probability p, there's some noise happening. And we describe, for example, the noise by a set gate. So there's some phase noise going on. So then the gate fidelity so the gate fidelity then it reads as follows so the fidelity of x and e is a minimization over the state psi of squared of this would be the ideal case. And then we have 1 minus p x acting on psi x plus p z acting on psi So you see now here we have the ideal state psi x here and here, and this one describes E Psi, right? And now we can calculate this. So the first term here gives us a one minus P, and the second plus P times gives us the model square of the overlap psi x z psi. Okay, now we do the minimization over this. We know that x times z gives minus i y. Okay, and so we have psi minus i y psi. And if we do the minimization, then this vanishes. So we can make this zero meaning that the minimum is square root of 1 minus p. Okay. So this should now simply be an illustrative example how we can now use those tools of the fidelity. For here we took the fidelity, right? And we defined something like a gate fidelity, which now quantifies how well we can perform this gate, u, right? Use the ideal gate, and this is the quantum operation that actually happens. 
and if we calculate the fidelity uh, of this as a minimization over all pure states, then this uh, measure here is independent on the state and it gives us kind of a worst case quantifier of uh, this gate that we perform. Meaning that the quantum fidelity and similar the trace distance, they not only serve to discriminate or to distinguish between states, they can similarly be used to quantify how well we can perform a gate operation. Okay, so and with this, I'd like to um, finish this chapter here on trace distance. And after the break, we're then going to start with a new section. Uh, namely, we're going to start with uh, entropy and information. So the aim is there that we uh, quantify uh, information. Okay. So let's do a break, and after break, we continue. Okay, let us continue uh, with the second and a bit shorter half of this lecture. Um, we're going to start with a new section, Entropy and Information. And uh, let us, in the beginning, briefly recall what we, what we studied so far and what we learned. So remember that often we uh, had the scenario in mind of Alice communicating with Bob and um, so far, we described, uh, for example, quantum operations, uh, which, for example, can describe noise. If, for example, say Alice communicates with Bob and there's some noise, so we described these operations. And now we also described uh, how we can compare now two states. So if they undergo, undergo some noise, then we can now quantify how much noise there has been in this operation or how noisy this channel was. However, what we didn't consider so far is, even though we, we talked a little bit about this at several times, is what is actually information. Okay? So what's, how do we quantify information? And um, when we started our section on the trace distance, uh, we already um, encountered how we quantify information of classical states, so to say. And there, what we again considered is that Alice communicates with Bob. So let's keep this example in mind. So we have Alice and Bob. And suppose that Alice so, wants to send Bob a message. And they, they do have an alphabet, um, which is composed of letters, which I also call symbols. So I use letters and symbols interchangeably. Suppose that these letters or symbols are a 1 to a n. And those appear with a probability p1 to pn in the message of Alice. Right? And those letters and probabilities are known to bo both Bob and Alice. Right? And you can imagine it like this, that Alice has some random variable, capital X. Right? And then she chooses those letters according to this random variable x. And then there's, say, okay, if she takes a message, say, for the moment, she only wants to send one letter. Okay, so then she asks the random variable, give me a letter. And she gets a letter, say, A4. And then put it in a box, send it to Bob. Okay? Bob gets this box, and now what we've already seen is that uh, the uncertainty of Bob can also be seen as the information. So consider that um, Bob knows this probability distribution, right? And consider the first example of all these probabilities being zero except P4. So if P4 is equal to 1, and the, all the other pj are equal to 0, for all, for all j unequal to 4, well, then Bob gets the message, right? And before he opens this message, he's certain what this message will be because he knows its probabilities. Okay? Meaning that there's no information content here in this message. So in this case, uh, uh, Bob knows um, Bob 
knows the message or is a certain uh, about the outcome of this random variable x and we also considered so far a second scenario where all these probabilities are equal such that we have um, uh, such that Bob is maximally uncertain now. Okay, so if all the probabilities are equal, then if Bob gets his message before he reads the message, he's maximally uncertain what the outcome is. Okay, and in this case, the information content of this message is maximal. So here, Bob is maximally. Uncertain about uh, the outcome of X. And you see that we can now, or it, it is reasonable now to, uh, that quantifying information must be related to this probability distribution, right? And the way how we quantify this information is by the so-called Shannon entropy. And um, so the Shannon entropy is a quantifier, and we will see in a second uh, how it looks like and why it is why it takes the form it takes. Um, let me state this as a definition so our new section is entropy and information. So let's start with the definition, which is definition 3.6 which is the Shannon entropy. The Shannon entropy associated to a random variable x whose outcomes comes A1 to An appear with probabilities P1 to Pn is H of X. So we also write this sometimes as H of P px or p1 to pn is minus the sum over all probabilities times the logarithm of these probabilities. I call this x. And the logarithm is taken always to base 2. So with here and below, The logarithm taken to base two. Okay, so let me recall this again. We know that classical information it must be conca contained in this probability distribution, okay? Because uh, we can associate uh, this, uh, the information with the outcome of a random variable. Okay? Simply think of Alice preparing a message 
if she, if she prepares a message from statistically independent letters, well, then this is a whole string of letters. And here we did the example where this message only contains one letter. And then she sends this to Bob. And then before Bob, uh, before Bob reads the message, then given this probability distribution, he can be more or less uncertain about the outcome. Right? If he is uh, completely uncertain, well, then it's this case where all these probabilities are equal. If he is not uncertain at all, meaning that he knows with certainty the outcome, then it must be such that only the probability of one such symbol as one and the others are zero. Okay? And keep in mind that we can associate now um, this, info, uh, this classical message, so to say, with the probability distribution uh, corresponding to such a random variable. And um, now the Shannon entropy gives us a quantifier of this information content. Okay? Or uh, in particular, what it does is it quantifies the uncertainty of Bob before he reads the message, or equivalently, it quantifies the information content of the message. So you can see those two things as being equivalent. So Bob's uncertainty before he reads the message is equal to the information content. Right? And this is what the Shannon entropy quantifies. So let's write this down. The Shannon entropy can be seen as quantifying the uncertainty before Bob learns the outcome of x. or equivalently the amount of information gained by learning the outcome. of this random variable x. OK, so you might ask now, OK, why, why has the Shannon entropy this particular form? OK, this is, if you see it the first time, it's a strange form, because it has this logarithm in it. And the reason for this is that the Shannon entropy, it also quantifies the physical resources which are needed in order to save this information. So it's, we can see it as the number of bits which are required per symbol to store the message. Okay, let's also write this down. So the chain in entropy takes this particular form since since it also quantifies minimal physical resources to store the information. 
means it quantifies how many bits per source symbol are required on average. to store the message. Okay, so it, it's not only a quantifier of the information gain if we learn the random variable, it also quantifies how many bits we have to, or how many bits are, okay, how many bits are needed in order to store this information. Okay? And this, this now uh, gives the, uh, I think you can now see why we take the logarithm to base two, right? Because a classical bit, or a bit has two states, zero, one, right? And this is why the logarithm comes in here to base two. And then this quantifies how many bits are needed. Um, so this, the fact that uh, the Shane entropy does quantify our physical resources, this uh, is due to the so-called Shannon's noiseless coding theorem. Okay? Uh, we are not going to state the theorem. If you're interested, you can go into the literature. Uh, but I'm just going to write it down. So this is known as Shannon's noiseless um, coding theorem. See the literature. And to get a bit comfortable with this, let's do an example. Okay. Suppose now we have Alice and we have Bob and suppose now they share an alphabet made of out of six symbols, say one to six. And what are these symbols? These symbols correspond uh, to those sides of a dice. Okay, suppose that Alice is throwing a dice Okay, this is which is the random variable x. She's throwing a dice and she gets then uh, the result and she sends it to Bob. Okay. And for the the first thing, suppose that we have a balanced dice. Meaning that the probabilities Pj is equal to one over six for all J. In this case, we have that um, the chain and entropy. Okay, we can calculate this now. So it's minus six times uh, one over six times the logarithm of one over six, which is the logarithm of six. And this is um, roughly two point five eight five okay so this is now if we have a balanced dice next suppose that we have a loaded dice okay so say we have a loaded dice uh, say that the probability that we get six is now not one over six but it's higher let me say one over three and that the probabilities Px of all the others are is 2 over 15, 
for all x unequal 6. Okay, then we can calculate the chain in entropy, which gives minus 1 minus 1 times 1 over 3 logarithm, 1 over 3 minus 5 times 2 over 15 logarithm of uh, 2 over 15. Okay, if you calculate this, you get out something like 2.466. Okay, so what we see is that now that we have a loaded dice, the chain in entropy reduces. Okay? And the reason is that before Alice, before, before Bob knows the outcome, or before we know the outcome of the dice, we, have now, we can now be less uncertain what the outcome will be, because we know that 6 will appear with higher probability. Okay, so we, have, we are less uncertain what the outcome will be. And now suppose that we have a fully loaded dice. So, fully loaded. You notice that we have p of 6 is equal to 1, and p of x is equal to 0 for all x unequal to 6. Well, then we have h of x is minus, and then we have 1 times the logarithm of 1 minus 5 times 0 times logarithm of 0. And this is 0. Okay. And uh, here, this means now that if it's fully loaded, before we know the outcome, we can be, un we can be certain what the outcome will be. Right? So we gain no information by, by learning the outcome. And let me stress here that 0 times uh, the logarithm of 0, uh, see this as the limit in the sense of, um, so see this as the limit of the probability going to 0 of p times log p. And this is 0. Right? So that's, if I write down this expression, this is what I mean. OK. so. I think this is a very nice example with which you get a feeling kind of what this chain entropy tells us. However, yet I think we, we don't have uh, a feeling what this means that it also quantifies the physical resources, meaning that how many bits per source symbol are required to store this information, right? As I told you, this is uh, this is described by Shannon's noiseless coding theorem, which we are not going uh, to state and we're not going to study this further. However, I want to do an example from which you can see that the chain in entropy indeed quantifies how much bits we require, uh, how much bits are required to store this information. Okay? So let me do an example for this. So let us again suppose that there's Alice and Bob. Which communicate. So Alice sends Bob a message. And now they're, suppose their alphabet is made out of four uh, symbols, a1, a2, a3, and a4. Uh, which appear with probabilities p1, p2, 
P3, P4. So suppose that L is, I mean, this is described by this random variable x. And again, we suppose L is, um, uh, she takes uh, this random variable and then based on this outcome, she sends Bob this message. And now uh, what we suppose is that these uh, probabilities are as follows. So, so suppose that P1 is equal to one half, P2 is equal to one quarter, and P3 is equal to one over eight, and P4 is also equal to one over eight. Okay? So this is what they know, and now L is, uh, takes this random variable, gets some outputs, and sends it to Bob. So um, now the question is, how does Alice, uh, how does Alice, uh, or which kind of, which letters does Alice use to send it to Bob? Okay, how does Alice encode, so to say, the outcome? Okay, what's A1, A2, A3, and 4? Okay, what's her outcome? And now let's say we want to describe this outcome in terms of bits, okay? Because bits is usually those uh, those unit that we use to send information. Well, if there are then four outcomes, then you would naively say the following, okay? So take the following naive um, encoding. You would say that okay, if the outcome is a one, then it's 0, 1. If the outcome is A2, then it's 1, 0. If the outcome is A3, then it's uh, 1, 1. And if the outcome is 4, then it's 0, 0. But this would be the, the intuitive or naive encoding that you would choose, since you have four symbols. Right? Now let's calculate um, what the, or suppose now that the message has k symbols. So, um, for um, um, so we suppose a message with or say with k symbols so how many how many bits does Alice have to send to Bob if this message has k symbols I mean, since every symbol requires two bits, she has to send two times k bits to Bob. Okay, so message length, the message length is two times k, two, sorry, two times k bits. Okay. Um, well, there are now there is now another way of how we can encode this. So, I mean, we are not we are not limited to two bits, right? We can use whatever kind of uh, encoding works, such that there is not a redundancy. So, suppose now the following encoding, which is let me call this a compressed encoding. First, let's motivate this. Okay, so what we actually want to do is, for a message with k symbols, we want to we want to find uh, encoding such that uh, as little as possible uh, bits are needed. Right. So we want to try to find an encoding such that we need less than two k bits for this message. Well, and then if you take a look at these probabilities of our symbols, it's clear that those symbols which have high probability must be encoded with very little bits. Okay? So if you encode now those symbols which appear with high probability with as less as possible bits, then we might have a chance to go below this. Okay? So this means that let's now encode uh, our symbol A1, which has the highest probability, let's encode this only with 
a single bit instead of a two. Okay? So su suppose the encoding that a one is simply, I think we had it, zero. Yes? Okay. And now say that a two, which comes with a probability of one quarter, so this is suppose that we encode this with one zero and a three with one one zero and a four with one one one. We encoded the symbol which appears with highest probability only with a very small number of bits, namely here with a single number of bits. And then uh, P2, which has a probability of one quarter, has now two bits, and the other one three bits. Okay. The reason is that the reason why we need here three bits is because um, if you write all these bits in a row, then you must uh, distinguish between those letters. Right? If you choose this encoding, and if you write, write them down, you can always be sure uh, by reading this, uh, this bunch of bits uh, which symbol is meant. Okay? That's why we need some uh, larger number of bits. However, what we will see is that even though we have here three bits, since those uh, symbols appear with very small probability, on average, this will reduce uh, the length of our message. Okay, so let's calculate uh, the message length. So on average, we have um, uh, we have here uh, a one comes with probability one half and had, has a bit length of one, right? Then a two comes with probability one quarter and has a bit length of two. Then a three comes with the probability of one over eight and it has a bit length of three. And the same for it, a four times three. Okay. And then the average bit length is this times k. Well, let's calculate this. So we have one half plus one half plus one half, and then plus three over eight plus three over eight gives plus three quarter gives k gives three, and then two, four, seven over four k. Right? And 7 over 4k is smaller than 2k. So, meaning here on average, we need less bits than with this naive encoding. And this means that we now found a compressed way. So, we compressed this message by choosing a different encoding. So, on average, if we send k symbols, we need on average only seven quarter k bits instead of 2k uh, with this naive encoding. Well, and how does now, how does Shane and entropy come in here? Well, as we stated, uh, Shane and entropy does quantify how many bits per source symbol are required on average to store the message. Well, what turns out is that this encoding that I just showed you is the optimal encoding, meaning that you cannot find an encoding such that you get a, a message length which is shorter than this. And this message uh, length is then is now quantified by our Shannon entropy. And if we, if we write, if we calculate the Shannon entropy of this scenario here, right, of this, let's calculate this. So we have minus one half times the logarithm of one half, then we have minus one quarter times the logarithm of one quarter, minus one over eight logarithm of one over eight, and minus one over eight logarithm of one over eight. Okay, if you do this calculation, what you will find out that it is seven over four. And now you see that the chain in entropy indeed quantifies how many bits on average per source symbol are needed to store this information. Okay? And this is why, because this compression here, this uh, encoding is optimal. With this, I think you 
get a feeling of what it means that, that we compress the information by choosing a, a proper encoding. Right? And we can and recall that we chose this encoding because those letters appear with different probability. And then we say that those letters appearing with high probability uh, we associate with, a, with a, a small number of bits and those which appear with a large probability can now be associated with a symbol which has a larger number of bits. Right, but in total uh, we can then reduce the length of these messages on average meaning that we have uh, compressed uh, the message by choosing this encoding. And now, Shane entropy does quantify how many, say, uh, just say it again, okay, how many um, bits are required per source symbol on average to, uh, to store this information. Okay, so with this, I think uh, we can stop for today. I hope that you got a feeling of what uh, the Shane entropy uh, is. And in our next lectures, we then first continue with classical entropy measures and then uh, after having stated some uh, useful properties of these entropy measures we're then going to quantify quantum information so meaning that we're going to generalize the chain in entropy to the entropy of a density matrix which is uh, which is our our aim and we're going to do this in the next lectures so see you next time